The sectarian violence in Iraq is as bad today as it was during the height of the insurgency. The rebuilding effort after the fall of Saddam Hussein was a massive undertaking, and the country was never really recovered. But do not blame one person for that, Emma Sky. She, the author of The Unraveling, High Hopes and Missed Opportunities in Iraq. The book, it tells the story of her efforts to help and the unbelievable things that happened to her. Now, I sat down with Sky just a short time ago. I think it's interesting for the audience um, to first understand how you even came to Iraq. Uh, you go back to 91, you were a human shield. You opposed the war here uh, in the first desert storm, and then obviously you had major issues even when you went in 2003 to Iraq in the war itself. Talk about why you went there um, before we get to, I guess, a change of heart. Well, as you mentioned, in the first, world, first Gulf War, I signed up to be a human shield. I was never actually deployed, but I was prepared to go. When the second Gulf War happened, I was also very much against that war. But the British government sent out an email asking for volunteers to go out to Iraq for three months to administer the country before we handed it back to the Iraqis. And I thought, this is an opportunity for me to go out there to apologize to the Iraqis for the war and to help them rebuild their country. It was only supposed to be for three months, and I had spent a decade working in Israel and Palestine, working in conflict mediation, capacity building. So I thought I'd got some useful skills to offer. So you get on the ground. Uh, first of all, you assume you're going to be working with the Brits and you'll be in Baghdad. Uh, nobody, I guess, greets you when you get there. And you find yourself 150 miles north, I guess, in the Kirkuk region when the British say you better work with the Americans. They're running the show here. Talk about what you found on the ground and how literally in a few weeks' time you were basically, in many ways, governing a province. I know it does sound a very unlikely story. So before I left the UK, I just received one phone call from the British government. And they said, get to the Royal Air Force Base at Bryce Norton, jump on a plane to Basra, and you'll be met by somebody holding a sign with your name on it and taken to the nearest hotel. And I thought, oh, well, it's the British government. They must know what they're doing. Sounds kind of plausible. So uh, that's what I did. I jumped on the plane, got to Basra, looked around, nobody there to meet me. And I thought, OK. So I jumped on another plane, got up to Baghdad, turned up in the Republican Palace, which was the headquarters of the coalition. And I said, hello, I'm Emma from England, coming out to help. What can I do? And they said, well, we've got enough people here. Try the north. Go to Mosul. So I went off to Mosul, got there, and they said, we've got somebody here, keep going. So eventually I got to Kirkuk, and I was told, you know, great, you're here. You are now the senior civilian in charge of the province reporting to Ambassador Bremer. And I was like, really? I mean, I just come to help. I couldn't imagine myself as sort of a colonial officer in charge of a province. And I'd only been in the job for one week before insurgents came to their house where I was staying and blew the house up with me in it. And I was very fortunate to survive that. It was a well-made house. So when the rockets came in, the walls were thick enough to absorb it. But that was kind of, you know, welcome to Iraq. That was my first week in the job. Talk about the Americans, your perceptions of them before you worked with the U.S. military, uh, some of the naivete that you write about that you encountered from them, and how your opinions changed over the years you were there. Well, after my house got blown up, I needed somewhere to live. And so I thought I'd better go and speak to the American colonel in charge of the province. And I suppose I knew when I went to Iraq, I'd have to work with Americans. But I always thought there's a line when it comes to the US military. But now I had no choice. And so I asked one of the soldiers I saw running around, I said, you know, take me to your boss. So he takes me, knocks on the door of the, the colonel's office, and I walk in and I say, you know, Colonel, hello, my name's Emma. It's slightly embarrassing. My house has been blown up. And do you have a tent or something I could stay in? And the colonel was, you know, we're going to hunt these people down. Hmm. I was like, no, 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 no. You know, they're attacking me because I shouldn't really be here. And all I want is a tent. And so my initial encounter, I was like, oh, my God. You know, I've never worked with soldiers before. How on earth is this supposed to work? And the colonel said to me, he said, look, let's work together. 
you're obviously going to replace me. You're, you're the first of the civilians who are coming in to replace the military. Let's work together. I'll teach you everything that I know, and then you'll take over. So I thought, OK, I'll be able to manage this. It's a short period of time. And much to my shock and surprise, this, these American soldiers, I mean, they were the 173rd Airborne Brigade out of Vicenza in Italy. These guys were extraordinarily well-educated, very experienced. They'd got their degrees from Harvard, from Yale, and they really wanted to do the right thing. But they didn't know what the right thing was. There were no directions coming down from above. So we're having to make it up as we went along. And they sort of envisaged different groups in Iraq as good guys, bad guys, and wanted to know why people were fighting us and why people didn't love us. So it was a, you know, it was a sharp learning experience for them and for me, but we found a way that we could cooperate because we all wanted to get Iraq back on its feet so that the military could go home. And this was back in 2003 when nobody at the beginning envisaged this was going to be a long occupation. I only went for three months initially. Talk about the scene before the surge, and you write about, um, I believe it was in Tikrit, um, just how bad the situation was in, in the Tigris River, how people wouldn't even eat the fish because uh, how the human flesh, how many bodies were thrown in there. Describe the situation pre-surge and that what you saw as the surge was put in place and I guess a stabilization of sorts after fully implemented. So Iraq really was on the abyss. It was awful. I mean, every day bombs were going off. Every day bodies were found in the street. And if they had their heads chopped off, you would know that they were Sunni. And if they got drills through their head, then you knew they were Shia. And there were so many bodies in the river that people felt that the flavor of the fish had changed because the fish were consuming all the human flesh. And every day, the smell of burning bodies, the noise of explosions going off, it was really, really awful. And the decision was then taken to surge. And this had a massive psychological effect, had a massive psychological effect on the US troops and on the Iraqis because people thought that America had given up on Iraq, that America had lost, basically. And when President Bush said, no, nope, we're going to give one tr last try, we're going to surge extra forces in, it raised people's spirits. At the beginning of the surge, our casualties went right up, and we were losing over 100 soldiers a month. And everywhere that General Odierno went, there'd be another note passed to him about more casualties, more fatalities. And it was so difficult. But he really, really believed that his soldiers could succeed. And it went on month after month. And after the midsummer 2007, we finally saw our casualties go down, and then the Iraqi casualties go down. And the violence just dropped hugely. It dropped massively. Up next, more with Emma Skye and how the US misread the politics in Iraq and why that led to disaster.